example that was given was the sodium potassium ATPase pump. I'm going to draw that in green. Yeah, there's better pictures out there, but anyways, so what we're doing is we have inside of our cell, and you should already know this, but potassium exists in extremely high concentration, and on the outside of our cell, sodium exists in an extremely high concentration, right? So potassium plus, sodium plus. And usually after something like a muscle contraction or after the firing of a neuron, or just maintaining a constant resting membrane potential of negative, I believe it's negative 30 or negative, yeah, I'm going to make negative 30 there, something that's negative value. Uh, it's not a, a net zero gain there. So we need to make sure that we have a negative membrane potential, meaning that the differences between the outside of our cell and the inside of our cell is a negative difference, right? So what we're doing in primary active transport is we are hydrolyzing ATP. So ATP comes in, it binds to that uh, aspartic acid, well aspartate in this context because it's deprotonated. It's phosphorus group, it's, it's going to bind to that, it's going to come out in the form of ADP. Um, we're also going to be using the magnesium cofactor involved in this and this is going to induce a conformational change that's going to actively be used to pump um, sodium out of the cell three sodium out of the cell and to actively pump two potassium molecules into the cell. Now they don't go through at the same time. The sodium binds inducing a series of conformational changes, what you do, and then this potassium comes in. But what you may be noticing is here I said that sodium was in a high concentration, right? So we are moving this thing to an area of high concentration. We are moving against the concentration gradient, right? We're moving from low to high. Potassium is the most abundant intracellular cation. So we're taking potassium and we're moving it against the concentration gradient to an area of higher concentration so that at the end of the day, and notice that we're losing more positively charged molecules than we are gaining it. That's why the resting membrane potential is negative value. I don't really know exactly if it's negative 30 millivolts. It's been a long time since I've talked about that since I was in paramedic school. But anyways, what we have on here is this positive an extremely high concentration of sodium. Now, this high concentration is given to us by the action of the sodium potassium pump. So, what we've done is we've created a super strong concentration gradient. So we have now, I'm gonna draw two arrows. You know what, I'll make it three to show that we have an extremely high concentration of sodium on the outside of the cell. And on the inside we have here, so say for example, Sodium is in very large amounts here. It's going to rapidly fall from a high concentration to a very, very low concentration because what little sodium cations we had left in our cells, we pumped them all out. And so now this concentration gradient is really super powered. And that superpower is kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. Eventually that it just says, oh no, we're coming down. And so secondary active transport is this process here. But while doing this, we can move in other polar molecules, right? Because sodium is charged, right? So we can have, for example, glucose can come in and can travel along with it. Or other compounds that are polar and charged can travel out. So that's the thing, is the secondary active transport is the form of transporting down a concentration gradient, down a concentration gradient, because of the extremes between those two that was generated by the primary active transport. So it's still a form of active transport. It ultimately resulted from the use of ATP, but it's using it as a byproduct of, of, the, of the first one's action. So yes, yeah, you can have primary active transport existing in the absence of secondary active transport, but not vice versa.